I'm Jamie Lewis, and welcome back to TheBasis.net. Today, I got actually a really cool lesson that I'm going to share with you. Uh, there's actually some advice that I got from a great producer friend of mine. This dude's totally legit. He uh, worked with Michael Jackson for like 20 years. Um, he's done movie stuff with Spielberg and George Lucas, and I'm not name dropping here to, to make myself look better. I'm just saying this advice came from a very, very credible source. And so anytime I hear things like this from people, whether it's in person or in a documentary or something like that, uh, it's just like, oh, I need to write that down because that was good. And so here's something that this person told me. And, and, and well, actually, the reason why I thought of it um, is because I did a session recently. Um, I tracked an EP uh, for, uh, for Real Life Church, which is uh, the church that I work at. And um, I was getting a whole bunch of compliments from from the artists and from the band members and uh, from the producer and kind of everyone involved on uh, this particular song. And I don't think I did a very good job on it. And it's kind of funny because as a sideman, it's and in this case I was, it's less important to me what I think, and it's more important what the producer and what the artist uh, thinks about what I'm doing. Um, and so I might play something that I'm not that happy or comfortable with, but they love it. And it's like, well, it's your thing. So it's more important that you like it than I do it. And I'm not saying that, you know, I abuse that or I'm, I put out shoddy work just for a paycheck. You know, I'm not, I'm not advising you do that. But they were really happy with it. Um, and... <laughs> It's not that it was bad. I, I didn't. I, I didn't do a bad job. It's just it wasn't my thing. I wasn't very comfortable with it. Number one, because a lot of it was pick playing, and I can play with a pick. I have, and I did for years, but I don't really anymore. So I've lost most of my chops, um, and so my timing's not as good. My feel's not as good. It's just it, it's not me. Uh, and it's funny because you know I grew up listening to punk rock and, and rock and roll and metal, but I'm not one of those bass players. I'm I'm an R&B, funk, soul bass player, <laughs> you know? Uh, and so anytime I get something that's rock-ish, and this project was kind of indie, sort of, or maybe more like Death Cab uh, sounding, um, it's just I always have to think, okay, what would this kind of bass player do on this song versus just kind of like me trying to do what comes naturally? I always feel like I'm thinking from someone else's point of view. And so I'm always just kind of uncomfortable with it and... Uh, Anytime I get those kind of calls these days, I'm really honest and I'll just be like, hey, I'm not that kind of player. Uh, but, you know, if you if you really want me to do it, I'll do it. But I kind of recommend you hire <laughs> a different guy for the job because you'll just get it done faster. Anyways, I, I, I bring all this up not to whine or to complain, but to try to explain why I think everyone likes what I did when I kind of feel so inadequate about it. And it comes back to this advice that this producer told me about that I uh, brought up at the beginning of this whole entire video. I don't think they like what I did. In other words, I don't think they're particularly in love with what I did. I think they just noticed it. I think they like the placement of where I did what I did more than what I actually did. Um, it, it just stuck out to them. Let, let me let me let me play a, a clip of this for you. This song's called "Our Hope Came for Us," and it comes from the RLCM Real Life Church Music uh, Christmas EP that we just came out with last December. Here, check this out. No good deed, but to live. So anyways, that's the part that, that I keep getting these, these comments and these compliments on. Uh, and by the way, uh, if you click on this link, you can check out the rest of the album. Uh, this song is one of five that we did. It was a little five-song EP that we released last year. So anyways, go check it out if you want to hear the rest of it. Uh, so anyways, that's the lick. Not that special, I don't think. Uh, but it is special mm, because it stands out. So why does it stand out? All right, so I'm gonna share with you a secret that great bass players have been using forever uh, to sound awesome. And, and, and first of all, uh, I need to back up for a second because I am not full of myself. Uh, I'm not big headed and I, I hate the fact that I'm using my own work as an example of, uh, of, what, of what great bass players do. And in fact, I just shivered a little at how gross <laughs> that sentence sounded because uh, uh, believe me, I don't think I'm that great. But um, I'm using this song in particular, the one that I played on, uh, because uh, this way I won't get sued for copyright infringement. So here's the thing. This advice that this producer told me, which again, great bass players have been doing this forever, is this. 
do your fills, do your licks, do your fancy stuff when the singer isn't singing. That's it. If you want to stand out in the song, play your lick, your line, your, your, your flashy thing, whatever it is, when the singer takes a break, takes a breath, uh, goes from the first half of the verse to the second half of the verse. I don't know what it is, right? But if you want to be noticed, that's the time to do your thing. Because uh, if you think about it, most of the time as a bass player, our job is to not stand out. We're this foundational instrument. The foundation is the last thing you notice when you walk into a room. If you walk into my room and you see, oh, I've got all these panels all over the place and this cool screen and there's a nice Aguilar amp and this and that. What you did not do when you walked into my room is you went, hey, this floor is really solid. It's doing a great job. All of your structures can stand up straight and, and, and perfectly and the ceiling's not collapsing on itself because your foundation is so strong. Yeah, no one would do that unless you laid foundation for a living, I guess, you know. So again, the bass um, is supposed to just blend in and you don't really notice it unless it's screwing up <laughs> for, for most people, right? So all you gotta do is just wait for the singer to pause, wait for that break, then do your thing and I guarantee you're gonna be noticed. And here's the reason why. Um, remember that the bass and the main melody, usually the lead vocal if we're doing pop music or anything like that, are actually the two most important parts of the song. And I'm not just saying that because I'm a bass player and I think that my instrument is one of the most important ones, uh, but this is kind of historically true. So let's travel back in time, like 350 years or so ago, um, <clears throat> to the Baroque era. And there's a guy by the name of Johann Sebastian Bach. And Bach wrote a ton of music, so much music that it's not even funny. And he, he, he composed these things called Inventions from the Well-Tempered Clavier. And uh, Bach Inventions are, are two voices. Right, so the right hand would play da 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 da, da, da and, and then the left hand would play too. But they were only ever just single melodies. Maybe at the end he would have a chord, you know, like multiple voices. But for the most part, it's two voices. In other words, I could sing one part, you could sing the other part, and we could play them together. So we only ever have two notes happening at once: a melody and a bass line. Right. So how was Bach implying dominant chords? How is, it, how is it that you would hear a seventh chord? Because a seventh chord requires four notes. He would play dominant sevens, minor sevens, diminished sevens, like a harmony that requires more than the two that you have. So how did he do it? Right? So you take into account the, 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 the melodic line, um, the passing notes, the neighbor tones, what was happening within the bar, and it tricks your ear into hearing like, oh, we're outlining a dominant chord right now. But you didn't hear a dominant chord. Four notes were never played at the same time, yet you still heard it. Why? Because of what the melody was doing and what the bass line was doing. And those two things together create the whole chord, even though those middle voices actually aren't sounding at the moment. They may have been before or after, uh, but the harmony is being implied by the top and the bottom. And so that's the reason why this trick works so well is because the singer and the bass player are working together in pop music and jazz and, and, and whatever the genre is. We can go back to Baroque and everything forward uh, is being done by these two notes, the melody, the, the, the high melody, and the low melody. You, the bass player, are still a melodic voice. Probably the most important one right next to that high melody. So let me bring it back now to, to, to the modern day, right? Um, and this idea of playing your bass licks when the singer isn't singing. And I actually have a perfect example for you. Uh, Paul McCartney, one of my favorite bass players of all time. And the Beatles is obviously one of the greatest rock bands of all time. And uh, <laughs> I, I, I can think of an example in, in the song, A Little Help From My Friends, right? What would you know? Such a cool song, and that line wasn't that great, but you noticed it, didn't you? Not just because you're a bass player, but listen to where it happened in the phrase. When you stand up and walk out on me, lend me your ear. Right? It happened in the pause of of the vocal line, and it sounds great. You noticed it, um, and everyone notices it. And again, it's not that special of a line. It's four notes. <laughs> There's really nothing intricate about it other than, you know, it happened when the singer wasn't singing. And so, again, Paul McCartney's a great bass player. Great bass players have been doing this 
for a very, very long time. And again, I'm not comparing myself to Paul McCartney, but if you listen to the song that I played again, you'll hear exactly what happened. Right? That 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 line happened in a moment where the, the vocal kind of took a break. You heard that lick, and then the singer came back in. And again, I think that's why everyone keeps saying they like it. Isn't the fact that I think it's that's cool, because that line is just not that special, but you heard it. And another reason why I think this is so important to know, uh, this, this trick, this secret the bass players have been using for years, is because... I think most guys do their their fills, their licks at the wrong time. I think most people save the good stuff for the turnaround. And the problem with that is everyone wants to hop on the turnaround, right? Uh, the, your drummer is going to do his fill where? Going into the chorus, <laughs> right? You're, if you're doing blues music, uh, think of like the... Everybody is trying to squeeze in their, their fill, their lick, their whatever the thing is at that spot. And if you try to do it too, um, you're just going to lose <laughs> because they're louder than you. They're probably faster than you. Their instruments are in a frequency range that just puts them in an advantage. So if you try to do something at the same time as them, not only will it sound probably cluttered, uh, but you're also just going to be either walking all over it or they're just not going to hear what you're doing because uh, you're playing a game that you're going to lose, right? But this is one that you can win. Again, the singer and you are like this. You guys are the two most important parts of the song. So if you think of it like a game of catch, the singer is singing the melody and he throws the ball to you and you do something cool and you throw it right back, uh, man, that, well, that's called counterpoint. It's called orchestration. That's called arranging. And it sounds brilliant when it's done correctly. So like everything, this isn't a, a, a rule. And I can show you just as many scenarios where someone does the opposite of what I just said <laughs> and it sounds fine, all right? So obviously you can break this, but... Um, that still doesn't change the fact that it's in my bag of tricks. It's one of my go-tos. I use it all the time. And again, it's a secret of the pros. I didn't know it until my producer friend shared it with me. And I went, huh, you're right. That happens all the time. That's a great idea. I'm going to use it from now on. So give it a try. Throw this in uh, with uh, your cover band or if you're playing at church um, or you're writing songs. I mean, whatever it is that you're doing, try dropping in this technique and see what kind of difference it makes in your sound. And then leave me a comment. Let me know how it went, okay? So take care. I'll see you next week here at TheBassist.net. Hey, if you like what I do, please click on the subscribe button right here. And if you really like what I do, then click over here to see how affordable it is to join me at TheBassist.net. But if you just want the free stuff, then click here to check out whatever YouTube's sophisticated robots think you should watch next. I'm sure they know what's best for you.